Hi there guys, it's a very damp spring morning as you can see and in our last video we had a look at Ramson's, the wild garlic and we explored it from an edible perspective and in this video I thought we'd have a look at another wild edible but it's going to be a fungus and fungus is generally associated with autumn but this one is very very abundant all through spring and all through summer and it's definitely one worth having a look at so let's go take a look So I've arrived at this ash tree, and this ash tree is worse for wear. Parts of it are alive, and other parts of it are dead. And if you look at the base, you'll see a fungus growing there. And the fungus is called Dryad Saddle, a member of the Polyporaceae family. So the same family as Chicken of the Woods, if you're familiar with that fungus as well. The term Dryad Saddle comes from Greek mythology, where a wood nymph called Dryad would ride the fungus, a bit like a saddle. But Fortunately, he's not riding it today because we're going to be eating it. Other names for it are pheasant of the woods or pheasant back fungus simply because of its look. Um, the top of it looks a lot like a female pheasant, the feathers on a female pheasant. You'll find this fungus growing on deciduous hardwoods, mainly from the end of April, start of May, and sometimes all the way through to autumn. And it's abundant pretty much in woodlands like this where you've got trees that are get infected with parasites and become a little bit ill and worse for wear and the fungus takes its hold, growing out of the heartwood of the tree, gradually killing it. And parts of this tree are breaking down, as you can see. Other parts are still alive, but I can't imagine they'll keep living for very long, simply because you can see the fungus taking its hold almost all the way around the tree. And it will continue to grow on the dead wood for a period of time, provided the nutrition is still there. The parts of the world you'll find this fungus in, well, it's very, very common all throughout the British Isles. You'll find it in Western Asia, all throughout Europe, and it has a very broad coverage all over North America. So a very, very common fungus to be able to find, and uh, very easy to identify, but we're going to pick some first and head into the woods, because uh, we're getting rained on pretty hard here. When you approach the fungus and you're sure you've got a good ID on them and you know what it is, just have a look at the age of them. We will talk about ID a bit later, when I have to move into the woodland, set up a tarp and get out the rain. Uh, once I've picked some, but for the time being, before you pick them, you want to assess their size. If they're any bigger than your palm, I'd leave them alone, because when they get big, they get very tough, they get papery, and they do make a good paper substitute in some cases, because the inner core becomes very hard and chewy, and your body can't really digest it. So you want to make sure they're young, no bigger than the palm of your hand, like these ones here on this tree. And they grow very fast, so if you come back a week later, they'll probably be the size of a dinner plate. So we'll get these ones picked because they're of a good size and you can check them as well by touching them, seeing how firm they are and pushing your finger on the underside of the bracket to see if it's squidgy because when they get old they become full of maggots and they become very squidgy but when they're young they're still nice and firm and they're ready for picking. Instead of pulling the fungus off the tree, which is something I often have a habit of doing, I'm going to cut it off and what that'll do is it'll just take away the fruit body which is what we want to eat and obviously preserve the root structure beneath, giving it a better chance of reappearing next year. You can see there the white flesh, very, very soft. And you can see the pores on the underside. And as this bracket gets really old, these pores will really open out and become like a sponge and they'll get pretty maggot infested. So you want to touch them and just make sure it's nice and firm. Just check the top, top and just make sure the bracket is quite rigid and that way you can tell it's ready for eating. But this part will be tasty too. So we've got our fungi here and it's of a perfect size, just ripe for the eating. If I'd left this a, a few more days, probably be a bit too big and the others might have been worth picking on then. But they're very, very small. I'll leave those and come back for them another day. But we'll make our way into the woods, we'll get this guy fried up, and I'll get a shelter up. So I put a tarp up, just to keep me comfy and allow me to stay dry. But we've got the fungus here with us, and I thought before we do some cooking, we'd have a look at it a bit closer from a point of view of identification. Talk about its nutritional content, and also whether there might be anything that looks similar that would be poisonous. So if we have a look at the top of the fungus, you'll see why they call it pheasant back fungus. You've got this patterning all over the bracket that looks like a female pheasant. And it's very, very nice, and it makes it very easy to pick out. And they will grow very large, 
four, five, six times as large as this, they can grow absolutely gigantic. To determine whether the fungus is ready to eat, check the base. It leaves a white spore print if you are interested, but by squeezing it, you should determine whether it's ready, because if moisture pours out and it makes a squidgy noise, you don't want to eat it, because the inside would have formed a papery hard shell on the inner that would be almost impossible to digest, and you'll be chewing it for a very, very long time. If we look at the base of the stem, you'll see some scaling, and that scaling is very typical of this kind of bracket fungi. The neck is often described in field guides as being dark and woody, and sometimes it is, but rarely. So don't let that put off your idea if it is. Most of the time this will be white, and when you cut it, it should be very dense white flesh that can be eaten as well. And these scales are very typical of the fungus. Fortunately, there are no fungi that look like this that are potentially poisonous. The only one you may mix it up with at a very young age is Piptoporus betulinus, or birch polypore, which can look a little bit similar, but to be honest with you, the top of the polypore is convex, whereas this one, a bit like a saddle, goes in towards the stem. There is, however, some concerns of eating raw fungus that you pick just off the ground, and certain people will have sensitivities to it, so best to cook it. All fungus contains a chemical called hydrazine, and uh, it is mildly carcinogenic. And cooking that chemical neutralises it, so it is something that you need to remember. The fire I'm making is relatively small, so I'm going to have it under the tarp and risk it. Uh, hopefully the flames won't go above there, and with a polyurethane tarp. You've got to be careful with the kind of wood you use, as I've found out in the past. If you use larch and conifers and woods that spit a lot, like sweet chestnut, you're going to have problems. But hazel is a relatively safe wood to use if you want to keep a fire controlled and obviously not have it rising too high. What I'm making is just a handle for my frying pan. This is just a titanium plate, the Life Adventure titanium plate it's called. The nice thing about the handles is they're generally quite strong so they don't tend to fall out. You can obviously make them as long as you want, so you can sit right back from the fire. The triangle just above the uh, bundle just allows you to pick the bundle up and get some oxygen in there. If you're unsure whether you're going to smother the fire or whether the tinder is going to burn out and not ignite the wood, simply just pick up the triangle and wait for the flames to rise in the smoke above the bundle. And when the flames rise in the smoke above the bundle, you'll know you've reached the right temperature and you can sit it back down and your fuel wood is now is lit. You can see it there. So we can drop this now. We'll forget about it. I've got a bit of bacon grease with me here. So what I generally do is take a bit of that and just prime the pan first. You can put that in. You don't need a huge amount. We can get this pan primed up. doesn't take much heat you see and this fungus cooks very quickly and there we go the pan is ready and if you've used your knife for other things you may just want to give it a clean I haven't really got too much on this it's very clean I sharpened it the other day so uh, we'll get this guy cut off Normally what I do is take away the fragile end bits of the bracket just because they tend to be a bit weak. And then you're left with most of the meat of the bracket, you know, the thicker stuff. And that can just be sliced thinly and popped in. And you can obviously mix other edibles with it as well. It doesn't just need to be the fungus on its own, it's just this is what we're focusing on in this video. 
there are plenty of wild edibles that could go with this. You could add it to a salad as well, provided you cook the fungus first. And the nice thing about this fungus is that um, you know, if you don't have any meat, it fills you up. And uh, much more than leaves and things like that will fill you up if you are out foraging or camping and you've decided not to take any food with you. These end bits as well on the stem are almost like fried potato. You can make little scallops with them. If you are going to make some cooking implements, and this goes for the handle of the frying pan as well, just make sure you take the bark off if it's coming into contact with food or in the cooking area, simply because there is a bit of bacteria in the bark and uh, you don't really want that getting into the food, um, although the risks are very minimal, but it's better to be safe than sorry. This fire's looking pretty good to cook on now. It's mostly just embers. If you don't want the fungus to boil in its own moisture, because it will produce a lot, you can angle the pan slightly so all the moisture builds up at one side and the fungi remains a bit drier and you can fry it a bit easier that way. So this is looking pretty good. And I've been cooking these for just about five minutes, not for very long. Just enough, just to soften them up a bit. But let's try one. Mmm. They're seriously good. They're seriously good. They remind me of steak. Have that same taste. Recommended. You can tell if they're not done enough, simply because they're too chewy. They should be pretty soft and easy to eat. It's much like a mushroom you'd eat commercially. That was delicious. I'd almost forgotten what it was like, it's been so long. I'll make sure I'll be out this year foraging a few. And in terms of storage, you can actually dry that entire fungi out, and that's what I did last year. Brought them into the house and actually uh, put them on a heater, and um, they just dried completely, and they were just like dehydrated mushrooms. And then you could throw them just in a pan or boil them and rehydrate them, make soups. You could grind them up into a powder for soup and carry that with you. Um, there's a lot of different things you can do with it, but if you're outdoors and you want to dry them for long-term storage, I'd probably say the best way to do it would be to cut them very very thinly and hang them over a fire just so you've got that warm airflow going up and you could shroud it with leaves much like you do a normal smoker just to make jerky. If you're drying the whole bracket it's going to take some doing um, so that could be a way of storing it long term. So in terms of nutritional content what are you getting from that mushroom? Well you're getting a little bit of protein, a little bit of carbohydrate, some vitamin D, a good amount of potassium, magnesium and also some iron as well. So it is a very rich bracket and um, there's quite a lot else in there that you could benefit from as well, I'm sure. But if you're out and you don't know what the mushroom is, just don't bother with it. The thing about mushrooms is they can be very dangerous, obviously, and generally a lot of people are put off by picking them simply because of all the horror stories that come alongside them and it shouldn't be ignored. Caution should be taken. So guys, I hope you've enjoyed this video about Dryad Saddle. It's very easy to identify. It's worth foraging for, and pick it when it's young and it will taste delicious. It tastes a lot like steak and mushrooms together, um, so which is really nice to actually have something like that that you can forage for when you're spending sort of time out doing some wild camping or so on. But uh, yeah, just take care obviously when you do forage for mushrooms because a lot of them are dodgy, and um, take a field guide with you if you're unsure and you should be fine. Um, but thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the video, and hopefully I'll see you in the next one.